company is developing the world's largest estimated source of battery metals with enough nickel, copper, cobalt, and manganese to electrify the entire U.S. passenger vehicle fleet. And it's doing this by exploring and mining the ocean floor. And with me is Craig Shesky, the chief financial officer of the metals company. Great to have you here. I'm just always fascinated by this company. So uh, your venture into deep sea mining uh, opens up new avenues for access to critical metals. Like, Talk about what you're doing in the ocean, how significant of a market opportunity is this? No, absolutely. The size of the resource is really the right place to start. I mean, the reason we and others are now pursuing this is that there's actually more nickel, cobalt, and manganese in one little patch of the Pacific Ocean than all known land-based reserves combined. So at a time when the world is electrifying, you need a lot more of these base metals like nickel, copper, cobalt, and manganese to put EVs on the road, to have renewable energy storage systems. This actually represents, in TMC's contract areas alone, the largest estimated undeveloped source of battery metals and the number one and number two largest undeveloped nickel project on the planet. So it's really coming at the right time, and I'm happy to talk to you uh, about more of it today. So um, how did you find, how did you figure that out? Like, how did you know that that had such a resource of battery metals so sure. deep in the ocean? Well, look, the uh, the British were actually the first to discover this resource back in the 1870s. The HMS Challenger was going all around the world's oceans, figuring out what lay on the seafloor, and they found that this patch of the Pacific has many of these what are known as polymetallic nodules with high concentrations of the battery metals that we're talking about. So there are actually companies in the 1960s and 70s who are out in this area of the ocean collecting these nodules off of the seafloor. Companies like Lockheed Martin, US Steel, BP, Shell, Sumitomo, Mitsubishi. But at the time, there wasn't yet an agreement from the international community on who owned the oceans. There wasn't what we now have, which is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and now the International Seabed Authority, the regulator for this industry. So TMC has done a lot of work over the last 13 years, uh, defining the size of the resource. And we now have both Canadian and US compliant resource statements. So we know with a high degree of certainty where these nodules are, but the work really goes back uh, the last 60 years and even before that in the late 1800s to discover this resource. Fascinating. So look, we talk, brought this up. What is this? What is it used for? Where did you find it? Yeah, <laughs> this is a polymetallic nodule from the Clarion Clipperton zone of the Pacific Ocean in TMC's Nori contract area. So there is a very high concentration of nickel, copper, cobalt, and manganese within this resource. In fact, there's a sufficient amount, as you noted, of those battery metals in situ to electrify 280 million EVs, effectively every single passenger vehicle in America. So this came from sitting on top of the seafloor and these nodules, they're not formed through a volcanic process, but they actually precipitate the metal from the seawater and the sediment on which they sit. So you have fields of these going for hundreds of miles, thousands of miles, where these nodules just carpet the surface. So it's really less about mining and more about collecting, more like picking up golf balls on a driving range. So the process to get these metals is quite different than traditional land-based mining. Now you mentioned the UN, and are they the regulatory body? Who is, how does that work? And then I wanna talk about the UN just uh, today said, ocean mining is going to be inevitable. So if you could talk about what your thoughts are on that too. Absolutely. So the regulator for this industry is the International Seabed Authority. It's a separate body from the UN, but it was set up effectively by the United Nations pursuant to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So really they've been around now for uh, 30 years, uh, first to come up with the exploration regulations. And we've been in that period now since 2001. And now to deliver the exploitation regulations, the regulations that allow commercial production to begin. And they are nearing the finish line on those regulations. So as you noted, uh, there was actually an article today um, quoting the International Seabed Authority Secretary General, Michael Lodge, where he noted that it does seem inevitable that this resource uh, would come online commercially. And that view, does, view is shared by uh, many others in the media, many contractors. There is a view that really the train is leaving the station here, that the rules are at a sufficiently progressed point where you can see that light at the end of the tunnel and we're moving in to the commercial phase of operation. Right, and I know there's controversy about environment, but this is done in a sensitive way. That's right, look, and, and one of the very interesting things about this resource is there is no digging, there is no blasting, there is no drilling. Uh, Post-processing, there's nearly zero solid waste, there's no tailings, and you're talking about a very significant reduction in the amount of carbon dioxide per ton of the metals that are produced ostensibly to fight climate change. So this is actually one of the best places you could think of 
to put a resource of this size and grade. I think a lot of people hear deep sea mining and there's often a negative knee-jerk reaction. Uh, I had my suspicions about it when I first heard about it uh, roughly five years ago. And now as we've heard more about what the environmental impacts are and what they aren't, we are building in confidence that actually this can be done responsibly and actually minimize the impact of getting nickel or cobalt or copper. Because keep in mind, these metals have to come from somewhere. And the alternative to picking up nodules off the seafloor is often much more invasive. So just like on land, there are certain projects that are palatable to society and certain projects that shouldn't go forward. It's the same thing in the deep ocean. There are other types of deep sea mining that have a very different set of impacts. What we are talking about is just collecting these polymetallic nodules, and we are very confident that the data shows this can be done in an environmentally sensitive way. So, and as you mentioned, the transition to a green economy, we're gonna need these minerals. So how does the metals company plan to meet the needs of the new economy, the new energy? Well, we plan to meet the needs by providing a great new source of these metals, not just to go out and extract them for hundreds of years, but rather to provide a new virgin source of these metals needed to get us to a circular economy. So the International Energy Agency predicts that you're going to need four to six times more of some of these base metals in the next generation to put enough EVs on the road, to put enough renewable energy storage systems uh, to be deployed to allow us to fight climate change. So there is an urgency to this. And what we would suggest is that being the largest potential source of these metals, why not begin the production responsibly, begin it relatively at a small scale and show the world that this can be done in a very responsible way. So we intend to provide a sufficient amount of these metals such that let's say by 2040, 2050, the world can really start to transition to that circular economy where you're taking EV batteries and seeing them recycled. So you can start to pull back on extractive industries. That is our long-term plan. Yeah, I was gonna ask about the circular economy and how that works. So it's really you're extracting, then putting back and reusing, recycling. So it's all kind of got a purpose. That's right. And a lot of facilities that could do the primary processing and refining of these battery metals could then be redeployed to recycle the black mass coming from spent EV batteries. So in order to get there, you can't recycle what you don't yet have. And right now the available stock of certain battery metals like nickel and cobalt is just not high enough to get to our green transition goals. So we believe this is a kickstart uh, coming at the right time for the clean energy transition. And there's also scientific research that will be going on while you're doing the, the business, the mining. Exactly right. Uh -huh. Look, and there has been scientific research going on for a very long time. Over the past decade plus, TMC alone has spent in excess of $150 million on our environmental and social impact assessment. Contractors within the clarion Clipperton zone since the 1960s have spent in excess of $2 billion doing research on the resource and the environmental impacts. So actually we do know quite a bit about this particular ecosystem and a lot of the data that we are now getting from our 20th out of 20 research campaigns that we've conducted is showing that this can be done in a way um, that allows for conservation and protection of the species that do exist down there. But what we're finding is the main environmental impacts such as the plume, the dust cloud that gets kicked up when you pick up these nodules. Again, it's more like picking up golf balls on a driving range. So there isn't the digging and the blasting that a lot of people might be thinking of. The dust cloud that gets kicked up is actually much uh, lower in scope and scale than was initially anticipated. But you make a very good point. As you start work, you're going to learn more. This isn't something where you get the green light and then it's just there's the genie out of the bottle moment and everybody starts to do it. No, it's going to be ramped up in a very slow measured way and that will allow the world to build in confidence of the quality and scale and responsible nature of this resource. So what's next for the metals company? Uh, more exploration, monitoring regulations? What, what's happening? Absolutely, next? so this is gonna be a very piv pivotal year for the metals company, as well as the industry in general. The International Seabed Authority is expected to finalize their rules to allow commercial production to begin and then adopt those rules in 2025. So TMC is operating really on a parallel timeline where we're finishing our environmental work. We will be finalizing our environmental impact statement. We will be finalizing our pre-feasibility work. Both of those are key tenets of our application to the regulator that would allow us to go from exploration phase into commercial production. So a lot of those milestones are coming. But another thing to keep in mind is that the geopolitics of this are certainly coming into the spotlight. You've had the United States come out with a lot of news um, focused on how the U.S. can catch up 
to China on battery metal processing and refining. And nodules are a quick way for the U.S. to do that. In fact, the Pentagon will be delivering a report expected in March on how the U.S. can catch up in the processing and refining of nodules. You've also seen headlines from Norway, where they're opening up their territorial waters for deep sea exploration. Uh, similar headlines from Japan and India and also China. China also has contract areas in international waters, and they are pushing ahead at a rapid pace, too. So I think that increases the urgency for the world to look at the science-based evidence on this industry and make sure that it's going forward for the right reasons. And we expect that to happen over the course of the next couple of years. Wow. This is going to be fascinating to watch, Craig. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. It's my you. pleasure.